You're listening to the Under the Ring Report, a weekly podcast that asks the question, why pro wrestling? Here's your host, John the Flesh Woo. And thank you for joining us for episode one of the Under the Ring Report. I am your host, John the Flesh Wound. And before we get started, we'll give you a quick history of myself and the show so you can kind of have an idea where we plan on going. I've been a wrestling fan for 40 some years. Started out watching shows like Wrestling at the Chase out of St. Louis, Missouri. Seeing stars like Harley Race and Ric Flair, just to name a few from the old NWA days. Pretty much been following the WWF, WWE most of the time, except during that late 90s period when WCW really pulled me in. And uh, right around that time is when the Under the Ring Report was born. Started that in 1998 and had the opportunity to interview many professional wrestlers and just talk about professional wrestling in general. About 2003, kind of uh, went into hibernation for a while. Always been keeping up with it. Always been thinking about getting started again. But you know what? Now's the perfect time. I've been heavy into professional wrestling again and enjoying it. So it's time to bring the Under the Ring Report back. And that transitions to what we're going to be talking about. Now, if you read the description of the show, we talk about why pro wrestling. I want to get that out of the way right now. What that means is I'm not going to sit here and give you results for the shows or predictions or rumors that you hear on the internet. There's plenty of podcasts out there to find that information. Also, plenty of websites and Reddit to get all the information that you need. Instead, I just want to talk about being a fan of professional wrestling. I've always just loved watching and just kind of the history of professional wrestling. So that's things like talking to professional wrestlers about how they got involved, um, talking to fans about their thoughts, why they like a certain wrestler, why they like professional wrestling. That's all going to kind of be here. It's just kind of a chance to talk about the sport itself and why we enjoy pro wrestling in the state it is. And it doesn't matter what they put out there. We still enjoy it. And let's just go ahead and jump right into this week's topic, The Undertaker Retiring. Now, I can still remember back to November 22nd, 1990, when The Undertaker first made his debut. I was a freshman in college, and it was Thanksgiving. And we would go visit my uncle. And the beauty of it was, is where I lived, we didn't get a chance to watch pay-per-views because we didn't have them. We lived in a small little country town. So when we get to my uncle's, he surprised us and had purchased the pay-per-view so we could watch Survivor Series. And, And I remember sitting there watching all the the wrestling matches going on and then we got to see the dream team come out dusty Rhodes, coco beware heart foundation and taking on ted dibiase rhythm and blues and the undertaker with his manager brother love um all i keep remembering is gorilla monsoon and rowdy rowdy piper on the commentary and all Piper kept saying was, holy cow, the whole time the Undertaker made his way to the ring. And this was the more evil Undertaker. He had purple under his eyes, wearing all gray. And uh, I remember seeing him tombstone pile drive, Coco beware, and then later on eliminating Dusty Rhodes. And I was just kind of in awe, thinking, who is this character that's on my screen right now? And, and how is it that he is just destroying these wrestlers like they're nothing? So it was kind of a big way to introduce the Undertaker to the WWF audience. Now, I was lucky enough to see The Undertaker twice in my lifetime. I saw him in 1998 in Milwaukee at a Raw's War. He was supposed to wrestle Kane in a casket match, but unfortunately, they uh, both had double count outs. So we didn't actually get to see him wrestle, but it's kind of cool to see him live and in person and Paul Bearer by his side. And the second time I got to see him was 10 years later in September 2008 in Stevens Point, Wisconsin at a house show versus The Big Show. And I felt very lucky to be able to be there live in the crowd and see The Undertaker at a house show. Now that I've rambled on about my thoughts on The Undertaker... We're going to take a quick break, come back, and we're going to talk to Scary F and Terry and Zach and their thoughts on The Undertaker. Under the Ring Report interview. With us today, we're talking to Scary F and Terry and Zach. Undertaker, looks like he's over. What are your thoughts on The Undertaker character as a whole? Man, The Undertaker is the last character that I think we're going to see of that nature. They're trying real hard with Bray Wyatt. But, I mean, how else are you going to pull off, like, a spooky wizard guy? How else could you sell that in the modern era? I I, I don't know if you can. I mean, The Undertaker, when you look at all the stuff that they had him do, 
I mean, I, I don't know if you're going to see Bray Wyatt taking Stephanie McMahon and putting her on a big hillbilly crucifix or True. something. I don't think you're going to see that. I, I don't think that you're going to see somebody go to those extremes and be painted as being that legit terrifying. I mean, I don't know. If, I mean, if for those for, for younger people who weren't around when it happened. I mean, did I remember being a kid and mm-hmm. seeing Undertaker come out and being legit scared? Well, I mean, you, creepy you think about it. 1990 is when he debuted. Mm-hmm. I mean, for myself, I graduated from high school in 1990. So for 28 years, this guy's been on your TV and pretty much been a part of your life. And oh, he's yeah. also bridged the gap from a Hulk Hogan to a Stone Cold to a Rock all the way up to a John Cena and Roman Reigns. So what other wrestler out there has even had that kind of impact on the business? I mean, at this stage in the game... At that level, I don't think there is one. I think that's it. Mm -hmm. Um, And these these guys and these and these women that are out now. I mean, I hope that 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 one or more of them finds that level of success 30 years from now. But that is such a singular talent. You know, I mean, who who else do you put in there? Even Austin, arguably the top drawing guy Mm -hmm. in wrestling, period. Didn't even have that long of a run. Well, and if you think about it, too, just using one character. Bruno San Martino may be the only person to even be with him because everybody else has different character changes throughout their career. Yeah. I mean, Austin went through God knows how many. And, and, and you didn't have, and at no point did Taker call himself Hollywood Taker. I mean, even, <laughs> even Hogan. Even yeah. Hogan flipped up his game. Mm-hmm. John Cena used to rap. Yep. You know, and, and um, Undertaker... I mean, when you look at what he was doing, you look at, like, the stylistic choices that they made with him. I mean, dude, back in 1990, that's when White Wolf was doing their Vampire the Masquerade mm-hmm. game. Goth was – that whole goth subculture was hot, and they just managed to – they The Undertaker keyed into that so much better than The Brood did. Yeah. You know, and how The Brood was named after a White Wolf character. Mm-hmm. You know, Gangrel was named after a yeah, White Wolf true. character. And um, The Undertaker just was able to – to take that and make it work. I mean, we'll we'll forgive Biker Taker. I mean, you know, he wanted to try. He had to hip up for ruthless aggression, so yeah, that happens. Yeah, and but he had uh, to have Flint Biscuit for his entrance. Yeah, music too, you know, which... <laughs> we'll, we'll forgive him for but that too. What other character hmm? could have gotten over a gimmick change with Limp Biscuit that terrible? <laughs> only the Undertaker, only mean Mark Calloway could have pulled true, that off. True, very true. But now let's switch topics. When you think of the Undertaker, what is the most memorable match to you? That will two come to mind. Both I've seen in person. Mm-hmm. One was uh, we we had a house show right here in Central Wisconsin. It was in Stevens Point, two thousand eight. <laughs> I was at that also. You were at that also, yep. yeah. So Triple H was supposed to be in the main event that night. He was the champion, WWE champion on SmackDown, and they changed the script. And on he showed up on Raw that night. So we're all sitting there expecting Triple H, and he didn't he didn't show up, but. They gave us a pretty good treat mm-hmm. <laughs> to replace him, and that would be The Undertaker yeah. against Big Show in a in a building of 2,000 people <laughs> in, at the Quant Field House in Stevens Point. Mm-hmm. That was a very unique well, and experience. The cool and thing about that, you know, Terry was there also. We talked to him earlier. Yeah. And oh, did he mention that too? <laughs> uh, yeah, we both talked about. But the funny thing was, that was one of the last times he did a house show. Yeah. You know, after 2008, he was done. He kind of took the, well, he he was allowed to take that time off. Not a lot of people are. Mm -hmm. But uh, the other match that really comes to mind was one that I saw in person again. Um, He and Shawn Michaels, WrestleMania 26, Mm -hmm. Phoenix, Arizona. Um, You know, it it was kind of almost the reverse script of what happened with Roman, where he's dragging himself up by, uh, oh, come on, man, just put me out. Put me out of my misery. You just just do it. And Shawn was... uh, you know, he was the man in that situation at that point, which is really, um, yeah, it's just really funny. Probably considered, uh, yeah, one of his best matches of all time. It, there are a lot of people that go back and forth, yeah. whether that match was real was the better one of those mm-hmm. two or whether the WrestleMania 25 one was the better yeah. of those two. I would, I like the 26 one, but that's, I got a personal bias because I saw it. Well, and, and that makes it all the more important for you. Yeah. Now, we posed the same question to Terry about The Undertaker's most memorable match. And not surprising, here's his answer. Oh, man. You know, for me, I think those matches that he had with um, with Shawn Michaels, mm-hmm. I mean, I know they're more recent. Yeah. But for me, like, his th- those last few matches with him and Michaels were just 
phenomenal. I, I, and again, I know they're later in the Undertaker canon, but man, I just, it just the storytelling, the pacing, and granted, the way wrestling is done these days, it's just the, the Undertaker had nearly 30 years to put those matches together. Some of his best work you are looking at, and, and Michael's too. I mean, let's not ignore his yeah, contributions true. to those matches, but you're looking at two guys who are just putting together just this amazing story but to hell even his match versus uh lesnar that was a shocker but yeah but he should have he should have retired after the lesnar thing that's the big thing for most people because truthfully oh yeah I after agree. the streak was over it was just kind of going through the motions yeah and okay terry everybody has their mount rushmore professional wrestling does he show up on the top four or is he in the top 10 of all-time greats? I mean, that's the one thing I've kind of been struggling with myself. Because, I mean, you know Flair, you know Hogan are right up there no matter what. And Rock, I don't know because he's kind of uh, uh, But the thing of it is is that all these guys had such an impact. And even John Cena, which not being a big fan myself, but he's not aimed at people our age. Yeah, yeah. But considering the longevity of the Taker's career, and if you take a look at everything... How many other wrestlers out there can you say they named matches for? The Hell in the Cell was made specifically for The Undertaker. Yeah. Buried Alive matches. Mm. You know, the, the Inferno match. All these matches, no one else has a match named after them because of who they are. Well, so what do you what They do you tried come? with the great Kali. Uh, the yeah, that prison. didn't work out. You can tell that still doesn't happen. Yes. But, I mean, when you take a look at all those things, where do you put him in your Mount Rushmore? Definitely top ten. Okay. A solid top ten. Easily top ten. Top top four. The four faces on the on the Mount Rushmore. I would have to think long and hard yeah. about that because, you know, for me, like, um, Austin has to be up mm-hmm. there. I think you have to put Flair up there as well. Um and those other two faces on the Mount Rushmore, Vincent Kennedy McMahon, without a doubt. Very takes good call one of yeah. them. Um, and that fourth face, I don't know who I could pick that wouldn't generate hate mail from everyone who listens to this podcast. I mean, that that's a tough pick. You make a very strong case for Cena being mm-hmm. up there. There is a very strong case for The Rock being up there. Okay, Zach, do you put The Undertaker on your Mount Rushmore? Or is he in your top ten? Yeah. Yeah? I think so. Uh, wh- huh. <laughs> you have to think okay, about that for so a minute. Here's the thing. If you would have asked me 10 years ago, probably not, uh-huh. because the, that's the, kind of the irony is the Undertaker's legend grew as that streak grew, and he really stepped it up at WrestleMania. But if it had not been for that streak, I don't know if he really would have. And his his early work, you know, isn't isn't that good no. when, when you compare it to today's standard. Mm-hmm. Um, but the character got over. Yeah, the character continued to stay over. I mean, granted, it went through a transform transformation period, but when he came back in 2004 and brought it back to the Dead Man, you know, it's not like people were like, "Boo, this is hokey, this sucks." You know, mm-hmm. they still they yeah. wanted to believe, and that's an important piece. Now, here's the one thing I wonder though, too. If you think about it, the Undertaker has never been the guy in all of you know what I mean. You think of the number one guy in the company, there's always been yeah. a Hogan, there's been a, you know, Shawn Michaels, all these guys, if you keep going. He's been that second tier. I mean, he's he's up there. But that's what I wonder about, too. When you sit there and give your Mount Rushmore, he's never been the guy carrying the company. He's been behind making sure the company's going where it should. Steady as he goes, 20-some years, there he is. But he's never been the guy. And when he got over as the Undertaker, he never he never took that jump to WCW. No, he never he never left really. I mean, granted, he wasn't really given a, a reason to leave. Mm-hmm. But there are a lot of people that you know back in that era they did they jumped around back and forth. Yeah. I mean, they they had that video of the Monday Night Wars that they put together on the network, which granted that's invented history. All well, that stuff. Very true. Uh, a lot of that didn't necessarily happen the way that they presented, but. What did happen is The Undertaker stayed with WWF and uh, Sting stayed with WCW. And that's – neither of them jumped around. Yep. There was never any question. So um, y- you can give him credit for that. Maybe he's on the WWF Mount Rushmore. Okay, Zach. That's a good argument. Guys, thanks for answering the questions. And because of that, 
You get a minute here to plug anything you want. Terry, go ahead. That's right. If you like talking about wrestling and nerdy stuff and listening to heavy metal, join me for Scary Terry's Saturday Nightmare. Five hours of metal, 7 until midnight, Central Standard Time on rock947.com. Like us on Facebook and make me look popular on the internet. Please, please, please. I'm needy and shallow. Please give me fake internet points. Cool. Now you get a chance to plug anything you want. I, uh, I'm a co-host of the Pro Wrestling Off Topic podcast with Zach Hagen Busher and Joshua Yeager. We try to update every month. Monday. I'm also the uh, the co-host of a Star Wars podcast, um, The New Jedi Archives. Uh, we update every other Tuesday. It's been a lot of fun so far, mm-hmm. and we've had a lot of people listen, so we really appreciate it. And that's going to do it for Episode 1. I want to thank Zach and also Scary F and Terry for joining me as we chatted about The Undertaker's retirement. And that's going to do it for this week's show. Thanks a lot for joining us for the first episode ever. And if you get a chance, you can check us out on Twitter at UTRR Podcast. Also the same thing on Facebook or visit our website at undertheringreport.com. Click subscribe so you can keep up to date every time we update the podcast. Next week, we'll be taking a look back at an interview I did with a Native American Tatanka. Thanks for joining us for the Under the Ring Report. This is Mick Foley, your favorite wrestler slash author, and you are listening to the Under the Ring Report. And if you don't listen, so help me out. (laughs) I'll, I'll laugh pretty damn loud. Have a nice day. Thanks for listening to the Under the Ring Report. Please visit undertheringreport.com and subscribe for free so you can listen every week to the Under the Ring Report.